Well, we're very lucky today to have another professor from Furman come and speak to us. Uh, Dr. Joseph Murray has been a, an assistant professor here at Furman University since 2015. He received his undergraduate training at John Carroll University in the Department of Sociology and Spanish. He then went on to, we have to say this correctly, the Ohio State University in the Department of Sociology where he received his master's and his master's thesis was on tracing the U.S. deficit in PISA reading skills in early childhood, evidence from the U.S. and Canada. And I'm sure he'll tell us what PISA stands for. And then he went on again to the university, the Ohio State University Department of Sociology, where he received his doctorate. And his dissertation was again on, on the education field, education in the area era of rising inequality and the distribution of school effectiveness. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys hobbies of running, playing his guitar, in the old days, he enjoys traveling like many of us uh, are looking back very fondly at and hoping we can do in the near future. He lives here in Greenville with his wife, Emma, and we thank him very much for coming and speaking to us today. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Mary at this time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, and thanks to Nancy and Jessica as well for getting everything set up here. I'm happy to take a, a part in this Lunch and Learn series uh, to talk about uh, some of my research over the years. And uh, certainly, um, we were talking before um, folks were let in from the waiting room, just that this is certainly a, a timely topic when we think about um, how, the, how the pandemic is influencing education and educational inequalities. So um, maybe we can touch on that in the discussion some. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to get my screen share set up here. Okay, so you should see a bunch of slides. And Okay, so everyone should be able to see the slides there and, and still hear and see me in the corner here. Good. Um, okay, so um, my, my talk here uh, is titled Schools and Inequality Revisited. So revisiting a lot of the uh, assumptions that we might have about, about schools in society and the role that they play in shaping or reshaping um, inequalities broadly in society. Okay. And this is a, a talk that I've, I've used different pieces of this in my, my class before. Uh, when I teach sociology um, of education, I teach that as a 200 level course or when I teach introduction to sociology, I have some parts of this talk in here. I've done a similar, um, uh, talk during the, the high noon speaker series. And so this is a, um, a, a talk that I, I really enjoy giving and, and um, I'm curious to hear everyone's uh, feedback on that. And then just on a separate note, it's nice to be presenting something without a, without a mask on right now. So this is, I feel so free. Um, so that's, that's nice and it's uh, good to see. I can't see everyone's face over here, but I can see some of you. So it's nice to have a, a live audience still as we're going through this. Um, and just also let me know as I go through if I need to move anything around so you can see the full slide. So just keep me posted on that. Okay, uh, with all of that said um, in, in, in the introduction there, um, I'll just continue to kind of build up the story here um, in some of my own experience in this research. Um, so, oops, which I need to get my phone out of the way there. Uh, some of my experience here, really in my earliest years of, of grad school, um, starting to work with my, uh, who would eventually become my PhD advisor, and just thinking about a lot of questions about the role that schools play in society in shaping and reshaping, and maybe even equalizing some existing inequalities out there. And so my advisor and I were starting to talk about all sorts of different research project ideas. And right around the time when um, I was gearing up to start putting together my master's thesis, um, that Dan read, read you the title of that, and I'll get, I'll get back to that one soon. But right when I was starting to think about that, it just so happened that the latest round of the, the PISA results were released. And so that acronym, PISA, is the Program for International Student Assessment. And so this is, it's an international assessment that's nationally representative samples of students from countries across the world. Okay. And 
really what kind of kicked off this this whole research uh, idea or getting into this uh, this this subfield um, was seeing kind of like what these results were showing us and really like how the what the the rhetoric from the press would be based on these what it would mean for school reform um, and, and, and all sorts of these things connected to educational inequalities educational policy and so on and so maybe you've seen some of these headlines before but I had a fun time kind of grabbing these from over the years. Uh, PISA is released every, every three years, and so there's a lot here I'm covering back to the early two, 2000s. And so we see headlines like this. American students fall in international academic tests. Uh, results are disappointing and lackluster. Or US, I have to move my video screen here. US students fall short against global peers. US students trail global leaders. You kind of get the idea, right? U.S. students slide in global rankings. Here's then Secretary of Education at the time, Arnie Duncan, saying that these results are really this indication of educational stagnation um, in the country. Um, U.S. students continue to lag. Uh, a lot of the same kind of um, language here used. Um, and again, this test, this assessment started in, in 2000 and every three years since. Uh, it seems like we get this same cycle that starts that the results come in and the result the u.s results are just not where we want them to be or where we think they should be um, and what then typically happens is these reports come out all the news hits and then there are critiques about the structure of our education system critiques about curriculum about how we train our teachers about how we fund our schools and so all of these things kind of come together to say like if we want to be serious about um, our educational performance on the international stage, if we want to be serious about um, closing achievement gaps, if we want to be serious about um, being competitive in a, in a global economy, that we need to do something about our, our educational performance. Oh, I still had more of these, right? There's just, there's so many. Um, it, it just isn't working. But even after, you know, we're spending um, a lot, a lot of money. We spend a lot of our, uh, uh, of, of, of our funds, percent GDP expenditures on education in the U.S. are quite high uh, by international standards, but it just isn't working is what we keep seeing. One more even for you. U.S. students show no improvement in reading science on international exam um, and, and that some of these gaps are widening. Okay. Here's one more look at these um, in some recent years. Um, just kind of seeing this PISA assessment will, will take us through um, performance in science, reading, and math. U.S. performance in math is, is um, the lowest performance category that we typically see, uh, ranking around 35, 40 um, out of, sometimes there's 60 nations in these, um, and the most recent ones um, continue to add more and more nations to the mix. Uh, some, some possible improvement here noted in science and reading where these are some better performance rankings for U.S. students overall. But even though there was kind of some reshuffling of the rankings here, uh, that this really didn't kind of break the U.S. out of this kind of middle of the pack performance and, and all the indicators um, seem to suggest that we weren't making the, the progress that, that, that many hoped we were. Okay. So there's just a look at, um, at at what some of those rankings look like from, from this PISA test, the Program for International Student Assessment. Okay, and so then, as I was saying, kind of this is the, seems to happen every three years when these test results come out. Um, the, they're released, uh, performance is, um, okay, I wanted to make sure, I just saw a comment there. Uh, uh, now that I'm reading that, I, I got the, I'm just going to address this. So how are the students selected to be tested? Is it apples to apples? And the really, these are all nationally representative samples. And so it's this really complex multi-stage uh, sampling strategy where nations um, participate. They agree with the folks that run PISA that said, we're, we're in this. And then PISA will work with them to do a, a multi-stage random sampling kind of procedure where certain districts um, are random, randomly selected or provinces or whatever the, the kind of uh, larger aggregate category is, uh, then random schools are selected within those, and then random classrooms are selected within those. So because of that, this uh, really complex sampling design, these results should be representative of a nation's full educational performance. Okay. I'm happy to talk about more of the ins and outs of the assessment later. Um, and so 
let's see. So, you know, this is again back to this is kind of the, the rhetoric that we go through, um, it seems like every three years. And so, if we are concerned about our national education performance, our achievement gaps, uh, chances for upward mobility, competitiveness on a global scale, et cetera, what do we do? Okay. And I'm, I am going to bring in um, several of these themes, um, but especially I'll, I'll talk about when it comes to achievement gaps, a lot of these reports will say that maybe our educational performance would be a lot um, stronger if we didn't have some of the um, socioeconomic uh, achievement gaps, for instance, that we see in the United States. Right, so a lot of the, the kind of reports that come out of this are saying, how can we, how can we address this issue? Because um, oftentimes, if we look at some of the highest performers in the US, they're right on track with some of the highest performers in other nations. It's just that in the US, we tend to have um, this variation in, in performance that's stretched um, much, much wider. Okay. And so we get to this question, what do we do? All right. Here are some ideas that, that, um, that folks, folks have focused on over the years. And I, I'm gonna group all of these into this realm of the school-based approach. Okay, so we see these issues with our, our education system, especially when it comes to global competitiveness on, the, on this scale, and maybe here's the issue. Improve our schools in some of the following ways. We could look at a more equitable distribution of school resources, whether that's funding issues or staff. Um, we could look into reducing school size, classroom size, uh, these kind of inputs. This is something that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a strong proponent of. Um, we could talk about greater accountability in schools. Okay. For, for those, if you're thinking back to the No Child Left Behind era, this was certainly a strong focus of, of, uh, of that legis legislation. Um, and even still, our current legislation, the Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA, lots of acronyms in this talk. I apologize for that. I'll try to make sure I spell those out. Uh, so the Every Student Succeeds Act, the, that's the, our current national education legislation, still a focus on um, accountability in schools, but maybe not to the same extent of No Child Left Behind. Uh, and then next, some focus on having um, stronger teachers is, is one, one route that this usually goes, whether that means additional teacher training, um, merit pay, higher teacher pay overall, um, th these kind of issues. Okay. But it's when we get to this point, and this kind of seems to be the, what, what, what happens here, results released, news stories come out, policy suggestions made that tend to focus on the school-based approach. Okay. And so here I'll share this anecdote um, with you. This is one that my, my PhD advisor likes to use when talking about this, this topic. And so um, just to use this analogy for the, the problem that we're trying to solve. And so if you can imagine here, the, the scene is a man um, on, the, on the sidewalk here, frantically looking for something. He's lost his wallet and it just has so much, so, so much important material to him, right? All sorts of identification and credit cards and cash. He's got to find this wallet. He's searching around on the sidewalk, eventually he gets down on his hands and knees and is just, he's, he's determined he's going to find it there. Um, and then a passerby goes through and, and stops and says, she says, sir, can I help you find something? He looks up, again, kind of exasperated and says, I'm looking for my wallet. Um, I, can you help me find it? And then she, she replies, she says, okay, so did you lose it around here? It's uh, dusk out now, starting to get light or starting to get dark and the street lights are coming on. And, and then he says like, well, you know, now that I think about it, it was probably a couple blocks back there, but the lighting's really good right here. I'm gonna continue looking here, okay? And so that I think is the, to think about that analogy for the problem that we're trying to solve here. And so if we think about the lighting, the lighting being really good on schools, trying to improve what's happening in our classrooms, trying to focus on that time, those resources, when really the bigger issue might be a couple blocks down, down the road. Okay. And so how, how I'm gonna frame the, the rest of this talk is to say, there are some, some pretty big problems with this school-based approach. Not to say that we shouldn't think about these things. There's, there's great research that says that we can see some, some, um, uh, some improvement if we reduce school size or, school, or classroom size. Um, but I, I would say that that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. And that because of these uh, three issues that I'm going to talk about. So again, three issues here with, the, with taking the school-based approach to um, 
narrowing achievement gaps or boosting our educational performance on the national level. First, and this is the one that I, I really enjoy walking through this example in my classes, in my sociology of education class. Um, and so first is that students spend the vast majority of their time outside of school. Okay, this is just when we think about um, you know, sociology as a discipline, we're, we're very interested in looking at things in a contextual way, uh, really considering the bigger picture there. And so I think this is just a, a, a great starting point uh, sociology-wise. And so this is the example that I walk through in my classes. I have my students run these calculations. Um, if you, you can grab a calculator at home if you want to uh, go through this or see if you can tally up these same numbers for, you know, thinking about your experience, kids, grandkids, whatever. Um, but so here is how, 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 to, how I'm breaking this down. This is the percent of waking hours okay, that the students are spending in schools in the classroom um, up to age 18. So from birth up to age 18 at the end of high school, so the end of kind of free for everyone formal public schooling. So here's some facts that we need to know here. The average student starts formal schooling, in other words, kindergarten at age six. And then as a necessary part of the calculation here, let's assume that students are getting the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. Let's hope, hope for the best there. Um, and so we'll take that out of the denominator as we move through here. In the numerator, we have the fact that we're looking at a seven hour school day on average. That's based on National Center for Education Statistics or NCES. So you take out some time for recess maybe or, or some breaks, uh, seven hour school day, times 180 day school year. This is, I mean, even there's some variation here internationally if we think about those um, performance rankings, right? Like some, some students spend a lot more time in school than others. Um, so this, this, we can come back to this, um, but seven hour school day, 180 day school year, times 13 years of um, formal schooling. And that's um, where there's an option that's uh, free public schooling for all. Right, so that's kind of the, the, the main driver here because anything before kindergarten, there's a lot more variation. Okay, we don't have um, universal policies for um, childcare or, or preschool. So this is formal schooling, kindergarten through 12th. So that would be in your numerator, your denominator. We're gonna take out those eight hours of sleep that the kids are hopefully getting. Um, and we're saying that your waking hours, 16 hours per day, 365 days a year, times those 19 years, birth to age 18. Okay, so we should, if I, I, I went through and checked this math recently, so this should still be up to date, um, that we have 16,380 hours in the numerator, and then 110,960 hours in the denominator, uh, and what this comes out to is that um, for, kit, for um, the average American student, um, that they spend about 15% of their waking hours in school by the age of 18. Okay. So this is just our, our, our first big uh, contextual point here, and one that's one of the biggest issues, I think, with um, kind of focusing on this, uh, on these school level um, kind of policies. While those might make a difference, they're just targeted at this 15% of time that students are spending in school. The vast majority of time, the 85% of, of that other time is spent at home, uh, at home neighborhoods and in communities. Okay, so some big differences there. Next, and this one I'll have uh, several pieces of data here to talk about um, problem number two with a school-based solution, is that achievement gaps are largely in place before the start of formal schooling. And this is one where we're getting more and more evidence from high quality longitudinal studies and so these are studies that will um, track the same students um, as they progress through their school years. Um, researchers didn't always have the best longitudinal data uh, of this nature, but we're getting some really interesting results from high quality longitudinal panel studies that follow the same students over time. Uh, to show you one of these, um, this is some data uh, from, from Brooks Gunn and colleagues. And what we have here, if you can, I think my mouse shows up. Right. So if you look on the y-axis, this is uh, mean cognitive scores. Um, so these are just uh, cognitive um, tests, achievement tests. And so the higher up the access you are, the higher the average scores are. And you can see on the, um, the x-axis is time or age in years. 
uh, longitudinal study here tracking students at different um, uh, years as, as they grow older. Of course, it's not every year, just a couple highlighted here, and we kind of connect the dots. Uh, but what we see here are the mean cognitive scores by maternal education level, so by the highest level of education that this child's mother has completed. Okay. Um, researchers talk about this as a, as a very important indicator of um, kind of early resources um, and, and later educational performance. And what we see is that, you know, maybe if we looked at just at this part of the graph at age 18, uh, PISA is usually taking place at age 15 or 16, so maybe around here, and we'd see that, you know, there's some clear gaps, and maybe we wouldn't be surprised to, to think that, okay, so these um, kids that are coming from families that are more highly educated, they are perform outperforming students from, um, from families with parents with lower education levels. Maybe not much of a surprise, but I think the, the thing here with this longitudinal data is that we see how, the, how these gaps, these achievement gaps, were in place as early as age three, age five, before school even started, before schools had a chance to matter. Okay, so I think that's, that's one big uh, takeaway there for this longitudinal data. Um, I'll show you, here's uh, some of the numbers from the, uh, my master's thesis. Um, the, the Dan reference in the introduction. And so here I look at this comparison. Well, I have some data for Australia. It's not as complete. So my main comparison is on, on the US and Canada. And here I'm going back to the PISA data, the Program for International Student Assessment. Students are about age 15 at this point. And here is the performance gap between the US and Canada that I'm, I'm demonstrating here with the, the black line. And this comes out to a 0.3 standard deviation unit gap between Canadian and US um, high school students. In other words, um, in more simple terms, that is, um, or this 0.3 standard deviation unit gap um, equates to about a year's worth of learning in school. Okay, so another way of saying this is that um, for this 2009 PISA assessment at age 15, Canadian students were about a year's worth of learning in reading ahead of their US counterparts, okay, about a year. And now what I did in this project was internationally, we don't have this longitudinal data that follows the exact same students over time, but I was able to kind of cobble together a, a comparison here where I took this same cohort, it's not the same students exactly, but the same cohort and trace this back to 1998 when that this same cohort age was when they were four to five. Okay. So if they took PISA in 2009 when they were 15, back this up to about 1998, and this is the same uh, cohort. And so here's a different test at this point. It's still about reading skills, it's just early reading skills. And what, what I find here is it's the similar ranking between these three countries, but the, the size of the standardized gap, it's a different test, so it's on a different scale, but when we standardize that, it comes out to just about the same, okay, about that 0.3 standard deviation unit gap. Um, and again, this is ages four and five, before schools, formal schooling has even started, before school has had a chance to matter. Okay. And I spend some time in this paper developing kind of the, um, um, a, a, at least a beginning of an explanation here. Um, I'm not able to test uh, much of this directly, um, but this, I, I argue that this isn't the case that Canadian students are just that much smarter than US students. Um, I, this is, I don't think there's compelling evidence out there for that. But instead, this has a lot more to do maybe with these early childhood social conditions in, in each of these countries. And the fact that maybe we see a more supportive social safety net in Canada, um, child poverty rates are lower in Canada. Um, there's greater access to affordable healthcare, universal healthcare policies, uh, things like that. Um, and, one of the, the pieces of literature that I draw on heavily here, highly recommended reading if you're interested, it's uh, called Differences That Matter. Uh, the author is Dan Zuberry. And what, what the author does in this comparative study between the US and Canada is he has this set in Seattle and Vancouver. So US city, Canadian city, just right across the border there, cities that share a lot. Um, so there's a lot of things in common here, similar kind of economic, um, um, indicators, similar um, immigration history and patterns, and he uh, focuses on these, these interviews with low-wage workers in the hotel industry, 
And so he finds uh, workers that are at the exact same um, hotel chain. It just happens that some of them are located in Vancouver and some are in Seattle. And so all of these things are held constant, that they're working the exact same job, similar cities, um, similar uh, level of pay uh, but before taxes and, and transfers, um, but finds that there are remarkably different experiences for how these families are navigating kind of the world around them and what that means, especially for raising kids in that environment. And just generally finding that in the um, Canadian case for these workers in Vancouver, that they have access to a lot more resources and a, and a lot more um, kind of ways to, to, to help their, their kids at this young critical age. So that, that's one explanation there for what we could be looking at, um, again, with this early achievement gap. Okay, um, next, point three here. So if you if remember um, all these so far, that one, kids spend the vast majority of their time outside of school. Two, that achievement gaps seem to be in place largely before school starts. And now, point three, that even after kids have started school, it looks like achievement gaps widen mostly outside of school. Okay, and we could, you could think about some uh, parallels here to what's happening with the current pandemic. And if kids are spending more time in um, more home settings, right, or um, less time in that um, structured, formalized kind of uh, classroom experience. And so here, even after kids have started school, we have evidence that achievement gaps widen mostly outside of the classroom. And so here's what this looks like. Um, this is one study um, from Downey and colleagues. And so Downey, this is my, my advisor from Ohio State. And this was some of his research looking at um, seasonal assessment data. And so this, this data is really, really interesting because we can see what's happening during the school year, but then also during the summer months. And so that's the seasonal component. And it almost works like a natural experiment where we can observe what happens to students learning when we take schools out of the picture when we're just looking at what's happening in the summer, when kids are just spending time um, in their home environments, in their, in their local neighborhoods, okay? Versus what's happening uh, when we kind of have the, the treatment of being in school during the school year, okay? And so here's uh, the pattern that emerges in this, and this is uh, nationally representative data for the US. Um, here's the pattern that emerges over the summer months. I have, um, again, we're looking at cognitive skills. It's kind of the, um, the outcome that we're tracking. And here I have um, high SES or socioeconomic status and low SES, low socioeconomic status. And what we see here during the summer months is that this achievement gap, so this is what, what we're looking at here, this achievement gap between affluent students and poor students tends to widen over the summer months. Uh, you might be familiar with some of this um, literature, these headlines before. This is all summer setback and summer slide. Um, I worked with the, the Riley Institute a couple of years ago to bring in a speaker on this topic. So it's, it's uh, certainly a, a timely one and also kind of applies to our, how we might be thinking about the educational inequalities in the pandemic. And this is, again, so we see the widening of this socioeconomic achievement gap over the summer. Um, but of course, as we learned in some of our earlier um, points here, that we, that we can observe this pretty large starting, starting gap at the beginning of kindergarten. Okay, so this gap was already largely in place before schools even started, before schools had a chance to matter. But now what happens when we look at the school year learning patterns, I think this is, this is just one of the most um, interesting findings out of this seasonal comparative research, is that during the school year, students from diverse backgrounds tend to gain skills, they tend to be learning, um, taking in this new knowledge at a, at a similar pace. Um, in some cases, we even see these gaps are kind of um, narrowed almost, but then during the summer months, when schools are out of the picture, that tends to be where if we see some learning gaps widen, it tends to be over those summer months, over the summer vacation, okay? Mm -hmm. So a very, very um, different way of thinking about um, educational inequalities here where we can think about all these inequalities we see in schools, but somehow schools are still compressing that, that learning or, or the learning inequalities that we might think that in a weird counterfactual world without any schools, maybe our best estimate of what would happen would be the summer months. But when schools are in the picture, they, they kind of smush down that, that uh, variation or that the widening of that gap. Okay. 
So there's more of that data, but it's usually at this point in, in when I do this talk, especially in my um, intro classes, where students will start to say like, well, how on earth could this be possible? How could schools serve this equalizing or compensatory function? That's, that's what I mean with that phrase up there, equalizing or compensatory, that the schools uh, serve this role as the great equalizer in society, that they kind of smush down that learning variation. Okay, but students all, like, will have a, a tough time with this and say, you know, this just doesn't make sense, sense to me that I could, you know, walk into a school in a very um, affluent neighborhood and just see it so well resourced and all the latest and greatest um, kind of amenities there. Um, and then you could walk into a school in a very distressed neighborhood and see quite the opposite. So how, how can we kind of like reconcile this with, with what we see um, when it comes to inequalities in our schools? And again, the, like the taking a step back here, the sociological view, this contextual view is one that would suggest that while there might be inequalities in schools, those inequalities aren't as great as what's happening outside. So inequality outside of school is greater than inequality in school. And this is, I'll show you next, this is just a, um, a graphic here, again, from Downey and colleagues um, to kind of illustrate this, that yes, if we look at our school environments over here and we imagine that this is the kind of the variation between uh, good schools and poor schools, um, that we see this variation here. Um, yes, there, there is some, um, but not nearly to the same extent that we would think about in the non-school environment. All right. So that even though schools themselves are unequal, they're still able to serve this equalizing or compensatory function in society. Now, just to add some more, more evidence to some actual numbers behind this kind of view, here's one that we often think that, you know, inequality in school funding is, is, um, is uh, quite an issue, and, and it is in many ways, um, but increasingly, this isn't as large of a funding gap as, as we've seen historically. In the 60s and 70s, um, some very severe uh, funding inequalities by district, but for more recent data, this is uh, from 2010, uh, from the National Center for Education Statistics, that we see per pupil expenditures um, in low poverty districts are up here. Uh, some of the, actually it's in the middle, right, that we see some of the inequities here. Um, but then in high poverty districts, uh, about the same amount per pupil expenditure is, is on average, is, is what we're seeing here. This doesn't mean that there could be some very extreme inequalities uh, from one district to the next, but on average national level, uh, we don't see some of the same huge um, uh, fund, funding inequities from high poverty to low poverty districts. And so I think it's important to keep this part in mind, again, when we look to that comparison between in school and outside of school. So here's another way of thinking about inequality um, in these two settings. On the y-axis this time, I have what's called the Gini income inequality coefficient. And so this is just a, a, a one number kind of summary here about um, the extent of inequality. So if the number is higher, that means that there's more income in the hands of fewer or that those resources just aren't distributed as, it is, as equally. And what we see here over time is that school districts, there's a little bit of ebb and flow here, but overall, um, where we see school district funding inequality now is lower than it, than it has been in recent decades. Um, and it's much lower overall than what's happening at the household level outside of school. And so this is the, the story that we've seen since the, really since the 1970s, is just increasing income inequality um, uh, among uh, US households. Okay. So again, thinking if kids are spending the vast majority of their time outside of school, um, what, what that means for these household circumstances. Okay, moving right along, one more uh, kind of piece of information here uh, to illustrate this inequalities inside of school being not to the same extent as outside. This is another way I like to think about this, is that we could look at children's um, time spent, children's exposure to adults with different levels of education. And so, by law, if you look at the blue bars here for teachers, by law, our teachers have to have a, a four-year degree, if not more. Some go on, some are required to have 
uh, master's, master's degrees or higher. And so when kids are in school, this, this is the variation um, that they're exposed to here is someone with a, a, a master's degree or higher or at least a BA, just that. But outside of school, home environments, we see much more variation. And um, these represent kind of like um, how we think about this is um, national um, average statistics here. So that some parents will have that graduate degree, some will have the college uh, degree, some college, high school graduate dropout. So again, variation for in school, who you're interacting with, and then outside of school, much larger. All right. And now, one more um, piece of um, kind of evidence here, one more way to think about this. And this is really just to tie into some of my most recent uh, work with some colleagues on this interesting topic I like to think about, I think of here is, is shadow education. And this is, um, it's called shadow education in the sense that these are educational activities that are occurring outside of formal schooling. Um, they might be subject to less scrutiny because of that, because they're in the shadows. And also because these kind of activities tend to mirror or follow in the shadows of what's actually happening in schools. And so these would be uh, things like private tutoring, uh, cram session kind of schools, um, trying to think, uh, private uh, test prep um, or learning centers, all, all these kind of things. And this is another way if we think about um, those inequalities outside of school, if parents of means, if, uh, if more affluent parents are able to leverage some of the resources they have to put into these additional supplemental shadow education activities like private tutoring, how that again tends to um, shape inequalities outside of formal schooling. And so uh, with a paper with my colleagues, we, we talk about this as the, the third, and it's a growing part of, our edu of the education world, this third institution of learning, where we might think of families and schools as the two traditional institutions here, that this new world of supplemental or shadow education represents the, a, a third and growing world. And what this looks like, here's just some international data that we look at. This is the percent change for a recent decade here of 15 to 16 year old students that use private tutoring services. So these are private tutoring services that they're paying for. Um, and we can see the percent change here across the board for many of these countries that participated in the PISA assessment um, in, in 2012. Um, only in two cases do we see that there's a decline in the amount of students that are using private tutoring. Um, overwhelmingly um, some pretty pretty serious increases here. So this is becoming, uh, it seems this, this global phenomenon where there's more and more services available outside of school that are typically fee for service uh, kind of programs, private tutoring, uh, test prep, um, uh, additional learning sessions. Mm -hmm. So again, things that would be tied more to those resources that students have at home, what, what their parents are uh, spending money on. And here's just, um, I'll show you just, this is just straight from our, our paper here, just thinking about all these interactions here with family and school as these two kind of traditional modes of, of learning that we look at, but then also this third institution. So what's happening beyond the school walls, all these ideas that I was uh, kind of listing through here, um, whether this looks like private tutoring, um, learning centers, commercial SAT or ACT prep, um, et, et cetera. And, and again, how these are all shaped by maybe demand for these at a, a macro kind of national level. Um, maybe if we're putting more emphasis on certain tests, uh, that will drive kind of the demand for this, this whole, whole new kind of like institution of, of, of learning. Okay, so we can come back. To, I know there's a lot there, but we can come back to that. I wanna make sure we're staying on track time-wise. Um, and so to wrap up then, I'm interested to see questions, um, conclusions. One is that achievement gaps in schools largely reflect inequality outside of schools. And kind of if you think back to kind of where we started and what do we do about our educational performance? Uh, what do we do about achievement gaps? What do we do about our global standing? I think this is just a, a, a really important point to, to note before we start to think about exactly how we're going to address these things. So achievement gaps in schools reflect inequality outside of schools, but then maybe, um, so maybe the, the most interesting part here that we 
might often forget is that maybe schools are doing a better job than we give them credit for. When these PISA results come out, it seems like we automatically go to where the lighting's good, right? We, we, we focus, we say we have the light shining on schools. We've tried different policy approaches in schools before. We continue to shine the light there. Um, and so just this kind of assumption that that's where we need to look, that schools are the bad guys almost. Um, but really, we, when we look at that, especially that seasonal data, right, that we see that schools might actually be serving this equalizing role in society. That if, if schools were not there, if we're thinking about only summer vacation or during a pandemic when schools are not doing what they normally do, that inequality might only continue to, to widen. And then last, that when it comes to improving our educational performance, um, and this is, again, this could be you know, within districts, across districts, or back to that international scale with the, with the PISA test. The, this is going to require a, a broader uh, policy approach, a more contextual approach that's beyond that school level reform. Not to say that those school level reforms like classroom size, school size, we do have evidence that suggests that we can see some, some modest increases in, in student performance when we do those kind of things. But again, going through the evidence um, that I presented here, just to think that that's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? And if we really want to put our, our efforts, our money, our resources towards the bigger issue here, I think we need to look beyond those school walls and what that might look like, what would really reduce achievement gaps and improve our national performance. That's going to be things that are going to change our, our, these bigger social um, inequalities, these broader social conditions. That would mean something like greater access to uh, important resources like healthcare, stronger social safety nets, and especially for those, I, you know, we talk so much about those, um, the earliest years, right? If these achievement gaps are starting to form so early, but they're still malleable, but they're starting to form so early before school even starts, um, such, such an emphasis there on quality childcare and, and, and preschool programming. So really getting at those years, again, before the start of formal schooling um, to, to really make an impact there. Okay, and so that I will, uh, go out of my slides there, and then I'm happy to take some some questions from y'all. And you here, okay. We have a question from Sue. Has anyone done research that can point a finger as to when the decline began in the United States and what the contributing factors may have been? And I think what she's implying is were we always this low or is this something we can figure out when, when it really started? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And this is something that for part of it becomes a data availability issue because a lot of these international uh, tests uh, weren't really, the earliest ones were in maybe the 60s and 70s. And for some of those assessments, um, US students were, were doing quite well, um, maybe uh, considered kind of at the, 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 the leaders of the pack, maybe not you know, at the very top, but, but, but up there. Um, and so I think in some senses, since, since that um, era in the, the, the 60s, uh, 60s and into the 70s, um, some declined thereafter. And I think a, a lot of sociologists would tie that to a lot of um, societal level changes that were kind of unfolding over those same decades where we start to see uh, maybe a, a rise in economic inequality in society. Um, but I would have to um, go back into the to the research to see if anyone's done a study to specifically pinpoint some some of the some of the specific factors um, that, that, that look at that. Well, Laura's got a question: Why hasn't Head Start been more effective, or was it effective uh, as a program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another, um, and I'll I'll recommend here. This is a really short um, read that's just all these different essay collections from early childhood education experts. Um, James Heckman is the editor, and I believe the title is Giving Kids a Fair Chance. Um, really short read, but lot, lot, a really um, a lot to think about there. And, and Heckman and, and colleagues in this book will talk a lot about the fact that maybe some of our studies that analyze the impact of programs like Head Start, that they maybe didn't have the, some of the best um, assessment designs in place. And really, if we think about if those programs didn't exist, then maybe some of those inequalities that we're measuring would be much worse. And so it's kind of this kind of counterfactual experiment kind of part 
where it's hard to it's hard to think about okay well what did the what would this look like if the programs never were implemented um, we do have some evidence not from Head Start but from other um, early childhood um, education experiments uh, the Perry preschool project is one of the most well known as is the Absidarian project and these were actually ones where they had experimental and control groups and so in the experimental group kids had access to high quality pre-k programming and the control group did not and these studies are actually the Perry one is actually still going still collecting data for these adults that are now in their 40s I believe but they were they participated in this um, preschool program and we're still seeing kind of continuing to see more and more positive results come in that those that were part of the experimental group that were able to attend this preschool program tend to have all these um, more desirable social outcomes, higher salaries, less uh, rates of delinquency, um, and, and higher educational attainment, et cetera. And so I think there's, there's a lot of good research out there that would suggest that, th that these kind of programs um, are, are, are helpful. And that the tricky part with measuring them is that you might not see some of those returns until many years down the line. And that usually ends up being a hard sell to, to folks when you're saying that we need the money to fund this, uh, just wait for 20 years, right? And then we'll show you the positive results. You mentioned about Canada and the United States being right next to each other on these tests, Seattle and Vancouver. What are some of the specific resources that the children have in Canada that they don't or is not available to the uh, children in the United States? Mm -hmm. Specifically for children, um, just uh, more access to, um, if not completely free, uh, subsidized childcare and, and preschool programs. Um, but then maybe also importantly for the, for the parents of, of the children, um, just the, again, that access to healthcare uh, resources to have a universal he healthcare program um, and in addition to that, um, some stronger kind of labor policies um, in, in Canada as well. So in that book, I referenced uh, Differ Differences That Matter by Zuberi. Um, he goes into length to look at, at some point, there was a restructuring of the hotel chain. And, and again, these individuals are working for the same hotel chain in, in similar cities, just divided by that US-Canada border. And when there was this restructuring, um, the, some of the individuals he followed in Canada had access to um, these kind of paid training um, uh, resources to, to help um, train for the next, the next job that they could take on and to have some kind of like matching there with, with some employment options. Whereas this wasn't an option for the individuals that Zuberry followed in the United States. It was kind of more of a restructuring, you're on your own, um, best of luck to you. Mm -hmm. Sarah asked you to tell us about some successful programs that have affected school achievement, such as preschool programs, quality child care, affordable health care, et cetera, in the United States that have been successful and made a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd refer again to um, that, uh, the, the book, uh, Giving Kids a Fair Chance uh, by Heckman. With, um, and so I, I think partially answered that with the preschool um, option already. So that we do tend to see these lasting impacts for um, quality preschool um, and, and childcare programming. Um, of course, that starts to, as soon as I say, you know, quality programming, that starts to get into an issue of what are we measuring here? How do we determine that these programs are of high quality? Um, so that's certainly um, a component there. Um, in addition to that, um, some of, like many of the school level um, kind of reform approaches that I first went over, um, I keep going back to the school, school size and classroom size, we do see some positive effects there. Um, and so that's something that has worked in the past, but the effects are, are pretty modest. And so I think it's really just um, taking this more contextual view here to think about that, that might move us down the road a little bit, but if we're looking outside of school, um, this is gonna be um, potentially more, uh, more impactful and to have a, a more longer lasting um, kind of approach. Um, and so in terms of some of these other stuff, I'm working on some of this with, with some colleagues now to actually look at um, specific policies um, specific, specific social policies. And it seems like there's maybe a, a pretty, a pretty strong connection between a lot of um, labor uh, policies um, and unemployment su supports. So that when 
you know, there's um, major restructuring or a pandemic or whatever, you know, some kind of major life, life event, when families have a, a stronger um, safety net, um, they, they tend to be able to kind of keep their kids on track um, in school in, in, some, in some important ways uh, versus if, you know, this event, loss of a job, whatever it is, just creates chaos. Maybe it entails, you know, several residential moves, changing schools, things like that, that this just doesn't, um, we don't see positive educational like outcomes associated with that, um, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, so I think there's a number of different kind of policy connections there um, when it comes to families and, and families' resources that they can use for their children. Okay, we have a question from Nancy. Uh, she's been impressed with the Montessori approach to early education. Has that been examined and used in early education experiences and preschool programs and how effective has it been? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, um, I'd, I'd definitely point out some resources that the Riley Institute has um, on, on Montessori programs in particular. Um, there's a number of firm and faculty and staff that, that work on um, assessments and evaluations of Montessori programs from South Carolina in particular. And these, I think, overwhelmingly, these, these assessments and evaluations come back with really strong um, results. I think one of the biggest challenges for the Montessori model is scaling that up to a, a, a larger level. Um, it's something that I think if we're talking about, you know, universal pre-K or child care programming, this is a, this is a big line in the, in the budget for sure. But I think with Montessori, that kind of, that the number goes up even, even more, mm -hmm. um, but for, for important reasons for the, for the kind of curriculum that they're able to provide for, for children, some of the one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, just overall, I think there's a lot of uh, strong evidence to support the, the Montessori program. Um, for sure. Uh, my wife spent many years at Legacy Early College, right down the street from Furman, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly deals with a lot of the students that have uh, these low economic backgrounds. Have you done much study or done much work over there with uh, Legacy Early College? I know some of your fellow professors have. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I haven't personally, I've done some work with some nonprofits um, in the area though. Uh, Neighborhood Focus is, is one organization that I've worked with before and they, they really stress um, a lot of focus on, uh, you know, we're talking about the outside of school time, um, thinking about after school hour programming, uh, summer programming uh, to that extent. And so I think that's certainly something, you know, if we're seeing the last part of the talk there, I brought up this idea of, of shadow education or, you know, parents of means, parents that have resources, um, exchanging those resources for these additional educational opportunities for their kids that maybe all don't have access to. And so to the extent that we can have um, robust, really strong programs for outside of school time, especially for the summer months, um, I, I think that, that can go a long way. And we're getting near the end. I, I think everyone would be interested to know what you think about um, what's going to be the long-term effect of our education system on all the levels that we've had as a result of the COVID and the uh, online learning. Have you had much opportunity to look into that and study that? Mm -hmm. And this is one that I, there's a lot of researchers that are, you know, running headfirst into some data collection efforts on this. So I think we'll have um, some more um, concrete evidence uh, of what's happening here soon. Um, but I guess based on the research I, I presented here, based on my, my understanding now is that we could really think about the, the you know, comparison here of online learning or kind of this, the shuffle to kind of th think about how we're gonna do schooling during the pandemic that what these learning opportunities are turning into represents much more of that variation outside of school, or it might look more like the summer months, or it might look like before school even starts kind of time, that we're just gonna see a lot more variation. Um, and that if students have a lot of resources at home, that's gonna provide a protective buffer against some of the adverse effects of the pandemic. Um, whereas if they don't have those resources, or maybe those resources were available at a community center, but that community center is not operating on normal hours. Um, that we might see some of these uh, educational inequalities um, start to uh, widen and that we might have some long-term um, lasting effects, unfortunately. Okay. 
All right. Any other questions out there? I don't think we have any. And um, I, I really appreciate you coming and speaking to us, Dr. Mary. And uh, mm -hmm. folks, uh, remember, we have this uh, recorded and you can send your friends and uh, family members there to listen to this talk on our uh, Ali channel. And uh, Dr. Mary, really appreciate you taking the time and coming to speak to us today. And uh, we'll be looking at maybe next year, we'll have you come back and Hopefully this whole thing will gone by and you can tell us what the results of this uh, will be on our educational system going forward. So thank you for speaking to us today. Yes, of course. It was, it was great to be here. Thanks for the invite and, and good to see everyone. All right. Good to see you all too. Thank you. Bye.